Maine has a long history of canoeing and canoe building. Archaeologists found evidence of canoes being used hundreds of years ago. It is believed that many of these early canoes were dugouts, heavy logs hollowed out to provide transportation on the bays and rivers. Soon light birch bark canoes that could be carried over land for portages replaced the heavy and cumbersome dugout canoes. Maine was the perfect setting for birch bark canoe builders. The numerous birch trees were large enough and the waterway is extensive. As new materials entered the market and Mainers explored new building techniques, the Maine canoe has evolved. The quintessential Maine boat is the Wabanaki birch bark canoe. They made the canoes of local materials, birch bark skin, cedar ribs, and other structural pieces, spruce root lashings, and a spruce gum, ash, and bare fat mixture made for waterproofing. There is not a piece of metal in these boats, and repairs could be accomplished with resources readily at hand. The group of Wabanaki in Maine are the Penobscot and Passamaquoddy peoples located around those bays and the Maliseet in the north. One can travel from northern Maine down to the ocean by the tributaries of our major rivers, the St. John, the Kennebec, and the Penobscot. Given the vast waterways, it is possible, with relatively short overland carries, to go almost anywhere in the state by canoe. In addition to the transport of people and trade goods, canoes were also used as fishing craft. In the summer of 2006, Abenaki builder Aaron York, assisted by two Penobscots, Hugga and Gwenhuit Dana, built the 19-foot ocean-style canoe in Penobscot known as Aquedon, hanging above you. The ocean-going canoe had a seaworthy hull focused on buoyancy for use in rough water conditions. An ocean-going canoe had a greater depth and curvature of the hull from bow to stern than freshwater canoes. The native building technique differs from the European style. The canoe is built right side up from the outside in. Bark is folded up around the frame and exterior stakes drilled into the ground. Rocks and bricks weigh down the bark to help it keep its shape. The gunnel with attached thwarts is lightly lashed to the frame. The ribs are steamed and then the builder kneels on the wood to bend it into shape. Planking and ribs are fitted into the canoe as it begins to take shape. Everything is lashed into place with spruce root and all the seams waterproofed with a mixture of spruce gum, bare fat, and ash. Recreation played a large part in the survival of the bark canoe. In 1878, Thomas Francis, a well-known Passamaquoddy canoe builder, built this 18-footer and sold it to a minister in Searsport, who paid $25, about a month's wage at the time. Both Wabanaki and non-natives built bark canoes for sporting camps, lumbermen, and anyone who needed a light portable boat. The builders of custom-made bark canoes could not keep up with the demand and started looking for a way to mass-produce the design. Starting in the 1880s, the wood and canvas canoe would supplant bark canoes in the marketplace. Many of the builders came from a section of the Penobscot River just north of Bangor. Evan H. Garish of Bangor is to believe to have been the first manufacturer of wooden canvas canoes and may have been its inventor. He started building canoes around 1875. By the 1890s, Garish had established himself as one of the premier builders in the state and was producing over 150 canoes a year. This 18-foot canoe, made around 1914, takes its graceful shape from its Penobscot and Maliseet canoe predecessors. Garish's success gave rise to other Penobscot River canoe builders, including E.M. White, B.M. Norris, and ultimately Old Town Canoes. E.M. White was a Maine sport guide who began building canoes at his Pusha home in 1885. As business expanded in 1896, he moved to Old Town. The same year, he built this 18 and a half Model 5 canoe. White's models were directly influenced by traditional bark canoes. 
other guides particularly those in the moosehead region the traditional gateway to the north main woods preferred his models unique features included overlapped beveled cedar planking half ribs in the floor gunnels extending beyond the stems a d-shaped stern seat and brass stem plates this twenty-foot model came to camden in the nineteen fifties for boy scout troop two hundred and was primarily paddled on nearby lake mcguntacook on its bow is the boy scout fifty miler award given to a group or individual who completes a wilderness trip of fifty miles in ten days in maine this usually means paddling the ninety two mile ten day allagash wilderness waterway in the north maine woods first organized as the vz boat and canoe company Bert Morris's company had a reputation for building and designing canoes specifically for the recreational canoeist. The 16-foot canoe, made in 1907, is one of the more simple designs produced by the company. Morris canoes have heart-shaped decks and closed gunnels, a vestige of birch bark construction, which was phased out in the 1920s because they tended to trap water and cause rot. In 1898, the first Old Town canoe was constructed behind the Gray hardware store. George and Samuel Gray were not canoe builders themselves, but were entrepreneurs who hired others to design and build their canoes. In the latter half of the 20th century, the company adopted more modern materials, such as aluminum, fiberglass, and plastic, to maintain competitiveness, becoming the largest and best-known American canoe manufacturer yet they still maintain a wood shop for its line of wood and canvas canoes. Our 18-foot guide's special model has appeared in every Old Town catalog since 1901. Ours dates to 1938. As canoe manufacturers looked to sell more canoes, they tried to alleviate people's fears that canoes were unsafe or tippy. This 18-foot Sponson canoe from 1948 was billed as unsinkable. Added flotation was built in under the gunnels to prevent the canoe from tipping over and afloat, even if it filled with water. A Sponson canoe like this 50-pound model from 1937 was often rigged for sailing and rowing. The additional width of the Sponsons gave adequate spread for a pair of oars. The wood and canvas canoe was built in the European style, turtled. The skeleton of the canoe was assembled on a jig. The inwales and stems were steamed, bent into place, and held by clamps. A strong back running from bow to stern was bolted into place and then steamed ribs threaded under the strong back and bent to fit under the inwale. The canoe was then planked with the ends loose to pop off the form when ready. It was then turned right side up and put into a canvas envelope. The canvas was secured with tacks and the outwheel. The canvas has a filler layer, a paint layer, and a varnish layer for waterproofing. With literally thousands of lakes, ponds, rivers, and streams, and over 2,500 miles of coastline in the state of Maine, it was only natural that the canoe became an essential tool of survival and recreation. Whether it's the white water rapids or lazy rivers, there's a main built canoe for every condition.